Earth Science, and welcome back. Today we are talking about glaciers, those big chunks of ice. We're going to talk about how they form, where we expect to find them in the world, how they melt, how they change the landscape that they go across. All very exciting stuff. Uh, one of the very few times that I get to talk about glaciers in my life. So I hope you, uh, hope you enjoy it. Let's jump into it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to define what is a glacier. What is what is actually constitutes, what's the definition of what a glacier actually is? And 75% of Earth's fresh water is frozen in glaciers. Uh, this is not just Earth's water, this is Earth specifically fresh water. And a glacier is a very large mass of compacted snow and ice that moves under the force of gravity. So we're talking very large. Remember when we talked about other forces of water, we're getting these rivers and streams that are also pulled by gravity. Same thing with the glaciers. And as these rivers, streams, and glaciers move over land, they are picking up materials, eroding it away, and depositing it uh, with glaciers thousands of miles away. So they're very strong forces of erosion. So where do glaciers form? Uh, glaciers form in areas that are always covered in snow. Now, usually we think this is the Arctic, but this is not necessarily the case. This is just anywhere that more snow falls than melts off, which creates a buildup from previous years. So this doesn't just include the Arctic, like we said earlier. It includes lots of different areas that are getting lots of snowfall. So on this map here on the left-hand side, you expect glaciers down here in Antarctica and up here in the Arctic Circle and Greenland and Canada and Alaska. But somewhere you don't expect glaciers is like Chile here or in Africa, parts of Europe, parts of Asia down here in like the Middle East. And these areas have high enough mountains. This is the Alps here, Swiss Alps. You got the Himalayas over here, the Andes over here. These are all areas that have very high altitude where the snow is allowed to accumulate over the whole year and it doesn't melt off. Now, the snow line is this magical line where glaciers can exist. So we can have glaciers on the equator uh, as long as they're high up in the, in the mountains where there's permanent snow. And the snow line is this lowest elevation at which there's a layer of permanent snow where there's snow year-round, January through December. Uh, it doesn't melt off in the summer. It stays through June, July, August in the northern hemisphere. Or if you're in the southern hemisphere, remember that winter would be uh, November, December, January, February. If a mountain has no snow on it during the summer, it has no snow line. So if you are in an area and you, at some point in the year, you can look at the mountain and there's no snow on it, you don't have a snow line and you don't have a glacier. You have to have a snow line to have glaciers. So glaciers form by this slow process, year-long process, where the basins and the kind of areas on this mountain are getting filled up with snow. And the snow can be hundreds of meters deep. As the snow gets buried, it gets crystallized into smaller and smaller chunks. Uh, this kind of diagram on the right here is showing the, the track of a single snowflake as it gets compressed down to glacial ice on the bottom there. So this thing is getting com compacted down to a much smaller size, and all the snow around the area is getting compacted down to this kind of size. Before we get to glacial ice, we go through a stage called fern, which is a snowball consistency. This is if you take a snowball, pack it up really tight. This is what fern is. As the weight of this snow and this uh, snow that's fern now is all pushing down, it continues to get compacted to form ice. So there are two types of glaciers, and they are uh, determined on where they where they formed. So the first is valley glaciers, and these are glaciers that are moving inside of a valley wall here. So this glacier is kind of like a river of frozen ice that's moving down here. And the second is glacial, the continental glaciers, and these are covering large chunks of a continent, not necessarily going down a valley, but more like just sitting on a large area, like Antarctica. Greenland, Alaska, a lot of continental glaciers there. 
All right, so let's start talking about valley glaciers. These come from high up in the mountains, above the snow line. They are going to come down to the snow line. This large river of ice uh, is also referred to sometimes as alpine glaciers after the Alps Mountains in South Central Europe. Think Austria, Germany, Hungary. And we have valley glaciers on every continent except for the continent of Australia. Australia isn't, doesn't quite have that nice snow line to get valley glaciers. Continental glaciers, they form inland, especially in the inland areas of polar regions. And all precipitation in these areas are falling as snow. You're not getting any rain here. You're just getting snow year round. So areas such as Greenland and Antarctica are getting these. And these can be the results of thousands of years of snowfall, and they can be miles thick. This is just a small chunk of this glacier here. We can see, you can see it's extending down underneath the surface there, probably going down to the continent itself. All right, so the shape of continental glaciers, they're usually circular or oval shaped. Uh, the glacier that is on Greenland is the size of Mexico, and Antarctica is the United States and Mexico combined. In this image here, the United States is superimposed over Antarctica, and you can see there's a lot of space in Antarctica that is bigger than the continental 48 here. Then we don't see Alaska and Hawaii here, but there's a lot of mass in Antarctica. When they talk about expeditions going across it, like those are very big expeditions. That's a very big, it takes people weeks to go from one side of America to the other, uh, the United States, now do it in the freezing conditions and on, with ice. And when we talk about smaller uh, continental glaciers like Iceland, which does have a glacier, these are ice caps. They are less than 50,000 square kilometers. So they are still continental glaciers. They are just smaller continental glaciers. All right, so glacial movement and erosion. Since these glaciers are huge chunks of ice and rock, they get very heavy. It gets very heavy and it wants to go downhill. Anything that has weight is getting affected by gravity. It is getting pulled down towards the ocean. So gravities are getting pulled. These glaciers are getting pulled by gravity down a gradient, much like waters and streams. The steeper the gradient, the faster the glacier. The, the less steep the gradient, the slower the glacier. So some glaciers move only a few centimeters a day. Others may move several meters a day for weeks or for months. They move faster after they have really, really heavy snowfall. We're getting more weight, so more weight means faster. They move faster if they're on steeper slopes. And they move faster in the summer where parts of the glacier are melting, but not all of it is. The things that slow down a glacier are friction between the valley floor and the glacial snow. This glacial snow is kind of sticky. It is going to want to resist kind of that flowing downhill. It's not like uh, that really powdery snow that forms avalanches. It's really compact. It's really thick. It's being pressed down really hard. It's not like an avalanche where it's just slipping really fast. Now, basal slip, this is the friction at the base of this glacier is heating up the ice. And as it does this, it causes this ice to thaw and to refreeze. So it'll thaw, refreeze, thaw, refreeze, usually thaw during the day, refreeze at night. This creates a great deal of water that is mixing with the sand and gravel at the bottom of these glaciers. And it forms this almost uh, kind of slushy layer. And this basal slip is actually this slushy layer has reduced friction and it allows glaciers to kind of slide behaving more like like a landslide than like an actual glaze like a uh, chunk of snow now basal slip is responsible for movement at the base of the glacier what we're talking about now plastic flow is what's in happening on the interior of the glacier or inside of it this kind of stuff is moving through plastic flow where the grains of ice are deforming permanently and then continuously as they move downward they become flatter and slide past one another so this is kind of like they're falling like this kind of sliding past one another sliding past these guys here so the inside's flowing the bottom basal slip is going to move slower or faster than the plastic flow depending on the condition so these are moving at different rates all right cracks and crevasses when a glacier comes to this very steep downhill slope, we can get these big cracks that you see in this image here that these guys are walking over. 
called crevasses. This is because the ice on the surface is rigid. It doesn't want to you know, go straight down into this kind of hole, so it kind of forms these cracked sections here to kind of go down a little steeper slope. These cracks, because they are a little bit different consistency than the bottom, they are not going as deep into the glacier because that glacier at the bottom is a little bit more pliable. It's got some melted bits. It's got sand. It's got, you know, gravel in it. It's able to slip and slide a little bit where these chunks at the top are really rigid. And that's why they're breaking to form these really long cracks as these big chunks of ice are breaking. All right, so what is the ice front? Since glaciers lose their ice through melting, when a glacier comes down to a certain elevation, it starts to melt more than it start more than it starts to flow. And at this point in time, we call this the ice front. So if we're not getting equal snowfall behind it, pushing it forward, it will now stop. If, for whatever reason, we have some climate changes, the melting rate is now more than the rate of snow, the glacier will recede and it will start to move back. And that's what this image here is showing. It is showing a in between 2006 in the spring and 2006 in the uh, kind of fall wintery area and seeing that this ice front here has receded. It has moved backwards up this mountain. So in effect, this glacier is getting smaller. This is in between nine years, so there's a long, lot amount of time. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it is significant because glaciers do hold a lot of liquid in them, frozen up. All right, icebergs. When the snow line and the ice front is close to sea level, many glaciers reach the sea. As they extend into the ocean, uh, they start to lose some of their structural support as these waves are kind of chipping away here. So great blocks of these will break off into the ocean. These become icebergs. And this process of icebergs breaking off of glaciers is called calving. In Antarctica, we have icebergs the size of Connecticut, the size of a whole state, breaking off of the continental glacier and then floating away into the ocean. This is really important if you're a polar bear. They really like the polar ice. So calving is good if you're a polar bear. All right, so let's talk about how glaciers cause erosion. And like rivers, glaciers are removing loose rock and sediment from the valley through which they move. They can move really, really small particles to really, really big house-sized particles. And we're not talking like mansion size. We're talking like tiny home, uh, one or two bedroom houses, still a substantial piece of earth, but uh, not like the Bill Gates mansion or a very, very large piece of property. As these glaciers are going through the valleys, rocks will fall off onto the glaciers and get carried with them here. That's what we have here. We have this really cute picture of this rock kind of riding this chunk of glacier that is calved off and is now this little iceberg. So this rock is a long ways from home and he's just continuing his voyage going on. All right, tills and moraines. These are depositional features of glaciers. As these rock materials right on top, become incorporated in or get dragged beneath the glacier, they're getting broken down. When we say till, we're talking about unsorted and unstratified rock, meaning it's all sizes and shapes uh, that is deposited by a retreating or melting glacier. And a moraine is the accumulation of the said glacial till. There are many different types of moraines. We're going to talk about a lot of them. Uh, the first two we're going to talk about are lateral and medial. Lateral moraines, these are the ones, pieces of rock that pile up along the sides of the glacier. They're getting pushed to the outside and then falling off. Medial moraines, when glaciers come together, they form this chunk in the middle of where their lateral moraines are coming together to form this medial moraine. So looking at a glacier you can count the moraines on it and you can well, excuse me the medial moraines and you can tell how many littler glaciers how many tributary glaciers have come into this larger glacier all right uh glacier cookies no there's not real cookies uh but these are mixtures of clay and silt sized particles as this crushing of rock beneath the glacier happens we call it rock flour 
And then the melt water or the water that's melting off of these glaciers is likely to contain that rock flour and is milky in color, so it's called glacial milk. It does sound like we're making the uh, recipe for a cookie, but glacial cookies are not a real thing, unfortunately. All right, striations. As glaciers move, they carry sand, rocks, pebbles. As these scrape along bedrock, they act like sandpaper, and they leave these really long scratches called striations. Striations show us the general direction of ice movement. So we can see that this end up here is a little higher, and this one here is a little lower. So this glacier was moving and dragging things along this line here. All right, the effects of erosions. Because these erode in a certain way, they are leaving behind very specific uh, depositional features. When the glacial ice goes away, we can now see these features. And the first here is the Rochez Mountain, Mountainese. These are these outcroppings that from afar, they're, they look like sheep. They're called sheep mountains. They look like little flocks of sheep. And as this glacial ice goes over here, it's breaking off these chunks and creating this kind of flatter surface on one end and this sloped surface on the back end. All right, so valley glaciers have a very, very important kind of erosion pattern here. We talked about with water, and when water leaves erosion, it is a V-shaped valley. V-shaped is, is water, as this water cuts through the bottom here. Only a small amount of this water is ever touching the valley floor, so it's digging that down deeper into this V-shape. Glaciers are going through the entire valley floor. They can go all the way up to the top, so they are eroding all of it. This creates U-shaped glaciers. And anytime you see a U-shaped glacier, these are glacial valleys. They were formed from a large chunk of ice, whether it's here or not now, that formed this really, really big U. They can have rivers at the bottom and then are starting to turn into V-shaped at the bottoms, but if you see these really big U-shapes, those are uh, valley glaciers that came through there. Hanging valleys. So this kind of dip here is a hanging valley. When tributary glaciers are flowing into a main glacier, they don't cut as deep because there's not as much mass, so they're not going as deep into the bedrock. These create hanging valleys. They're higher up in the valley than the main valley. The main valley is down here below it. And if water starts to flow through here, we get these hanging waterfalls which are very, very gorgeous, very, very cool kind of features that we see in these glacier countries. All right, cirques. These are a semicircular basin found at the head of a glacial valley formed by a valley glacier. When the snow melts, it forms these cirque lakes. If two cirques are nearby, they can cause this kind of cool steep divide called an arete. And if three are cutting into the same one, we can get this pyramid-shaped peak called a horn. And a very famous example is the Matterhorn. So cirques, arates are two, and then horns are three. All right, continental glaciers. We are also getting erosion like these guys. These are also, uh, you know, very much like our valley glaciers, removing loose rock and soil. They smooth, striate, groove the bedrock. And because these guys are covering the mountaintops, they are grinding down the peaks, leaving them polished and rounded, unlike our valley glaciers that are forming those arates and those horns. Uh, continental glaciers are very common in the United States and Canada. So we get a lot of this erosion uh, features here. All right, when glaciers melt, they leave behind deposits of whatever they were carrying, usually eroded rock materials. These unsorted and unstratified material, once again, are directly called till. And then the materials are called outwash. And these really big outwash plains here are all of this water that is coming off of this melted glacier. There are many different types of glacial deposits and some lakes that are associated with them. We're going to go through a couple of them. We're going to start with uh, some more moraines. As these glaciers retreat, some of this is left behind. There's many different types formed from many different processes. The first is ground moraine, which is this picture here. 
where it's a large, fairly even blanket of till formed when the ice at the bottom of a glacier is melted. It deposits all this material exactly where it dropped it, retreats. An end moraine is kind of what we have here, and this is at the ice front. Rock materials brought forward by a glacier pile up as the ice melts. If this ice front doesn't move, this ground moraine will get very large. Recessional moraines, these are formed as receding ice stops in new places behind the first one. So in this one here, these kind of ones that are here are recessional moraines. They are formed as that ice continues to retreat. And the terminal moraine, which is out here, is the end moraine uh, marking how far a glacier has ever advanced. So this is the first, and then as it, it retreats here, it leaves behind these recessional moraines. The materials inside moraines vary much like uh, any other material carried by glaciers. It's going to be unsorted, unstratified. Large boulders that have been transported into an area get a special name. They're called erratics. These are some examples of erratics here. The composition of erratics will be different than the surrounding bedrock. They are transported materials that have been carried a long way. They will be a different composition than the bedrock that they now reside on. All right, drumlins. This is a very long. This is a very picture from far up. Drumlins are long, smooth, canoe-shaped hills formed as glaciers travel over old moraines. Uh, as it does, it drags these moraines out into these structures. They're usually in groups, and they usually all point in the same direction. Like for example, these guys are all pointing in this direction. Let's use red. It shows up a little bit better. So we can tell that this glacier was moving this way. This is caused by this glacier taking these moraines and pushing them into these long strips as they move over the top of them. All right, outwash plains. We've kind of mentioned it already, but this is the glacial meltwater that is pouring out the ice front. It has rock, flour, sand, gravel in it. And these deposit these substances as they slow down, which can be up to a mile in front of the ice front. These deposits look a lot like alluvial fans of rivers, and in, we call them outwash plains. So this here is an outwash plain. It's got these kind of like twisty patterns here that you would expect like at a delta, but it is caused by a glacier and not by a river. All right, eskers. Much of the water inside of a melting glacier is trying to get to the bottom so it will fall to the base. As they run through the glacier, they pick up sediments and gravel and carry them with them. They form these little miniature rivers inside of the glaciers. When the glaciers melt, these sediments that are deposited form these long winding ridges called eskers. So this was a little river inside of a glacier at some point in time. All right, cames. These are small cone-shaped hills. Uh, the came is right here of stratified sand and gravel. As this stream flows over the top of the glacier, it will deposit this material at the ice front. So it will like go over the top, fall down. That's why it forms this cool little like rounded mound here. And these form over a long time of water depositing sediments, not ice. So this is the water that's running over the top of the glaciers, carrying these sediments, rock flower, what it may be with them. All right, kettles. These are bowl-shaped hollows found in moraines and outwash plains. They are left behind blocks of ice that got covered with other kind of outwash material. As this ice melts, the water drains, leaving a kettle. And if it is below the water table, this kettle will form a kettle lake. All right, glacial lakes. Uh, we talked about kettle lakes already, but there are many different ways that these glacial Rivers can form lakes. The first is moraine dammed lakes. When these rivers are blocked by glacial moraines, they will now form kind of this lake inside of the moraine. They can be formed by glacial erosion, as these glaciers are actually scooping out a chunk of land, or they can be formed by kettle lakes, as these lakes are filled with groundwater, runoff, whatever it may be. So these are all examples of kettle lakes out here in this picture. All right, the ice ages. The Earth has shown geologists that it's gone through many periods of extensive glaciation in the past. We call these periods of glaciation ice ages. 
and these are associated with times when the Earth got really, really cold. The whole global kind of environment cooled down. So, periods of glaciation in uh, 2 million years ago and lasting until around 11,000 years ago, Earth underwent really, really extensive periods of glaciation. 11,000 years ago, we uh, kind of started to figure out the agriculture thing, so that's when we kind of popped up into the, the picture. But during this time, ice covered a lot of North America all the way down to Illinois. In Europe, ice covered Scandinavia, the British Isles, reached down into Germany and Russia, had a large kind of effect on scoping out and making those landscapes. While we can't go back and see the ice ages, we can see what they left behind. We can find erratics in glacial till. We can find deposits of till all over Canada and the United States. In the Rockies, the bedrock is scraped and striated, even on the tops of mountains. So we had to have something getting carried around up there. Thermal moraines show the farthest advances in the United States, once again around Illinois. We can see these, these final mounds where these glaciers stopped. Now, what caused the Ice Ages? There are many theories for the cause of the Ice Ages. The top among them are, one, there was changes in the position of the Earth relative to the Sun. Uh, two, there was changes in the atmospheric carbon dioxide level. Three, there was changes in the position of Earth's land masses. And four, there was changes in the amount of solar radiation reaching Earth. We are pretty sure each of these played a role. We aren't sure which one was the most important, like which one was the determining factor, but they all played a role, and we're going to talk about each of them briefly. The first is Earth position. Remember that we are around 23.4, 23.5 degrees off our axis as we orbit. This causes a change in weather for us. This causes our seasons. Our orbit around the sun also varies, so that every 100,000 years, uh, Earth is the farthest away from the sun. And our axis also wobbles. It changes kind of like, like slow, like a top spinning around. It wobbles almost every 23,000 years. So this wobble, tied with this distance, would have made it so that less light was hitting the polar regions, cooling them off, increasing the snowfall, increasing the glaciers. Uh, this was discovered by Malutin Milankovic, and it's called the Milankovic Theory. The second kind of factor here is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that keeps us warm by absorbing the heat that Earth radiates and releases it in random directions. It keeps it from going back into space. So while some heat still gets back out to space, much more of it is radiated back to Earth in with larger CO2 amounts. In the past, uh, carbon dioxide amounts could have dropped, which have led to global cooling as we're not keeping in as much heat. This may have been caused by extensive mountain building, uh, pl the flora and fauna of the, of the time might have had an influence on this. Lots of different factors going into the carbon dioxide levels. All right, the position of Earth's land masses. As these land masses were moving, moving to higher latitudes could have cooled them off. Uh, it could have also changed how the ocean current patterns were working, preventing the flow of warm water to higher latitudes keeping it more centralized around the equator. This prevention of the mixing could have uh, resulted in more snow and resulted in more glaciers. This would have been a more regional effect, though. So it would have, you know, that's probably why we see it a lot in the northern hemisphere for the ice ages, a lot of evidence up there. And our last kind of point here is the Great Lakes. In North America, during our most recent ice age, uh, we got the Great Lakes, or at least it contributed heavily to the formation of the Great Lakes. As these glaciers receded, they widened and deepened valleys, they deposited large terminal moraines, their weight of the earth caused depression, the weight of these glaciers caused a depression on the earth, and as these guys receded, they were filled with snowmelt. This also created Niagara Falls, as we had this hanging valley. Uh, this concludes our discussion on glaciers, I hope you now understand what a glacier is, where to find them, uh, the drastic effect that they can have on the landscape, and kind of like why we care and how we know they were here. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, thanks for watching. See you in the next one.